Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson, and I'm joined, as always, by my video bro. He is the man with the angelic voice, the throat of the goat, Papa Smokes. How the hell are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Munson. And how are you wrestling people doing out there? We hope that everybody's doing fantastic, enjoying some good old-fashioned wrestling, and also enjoying some modern-day wrestling, whatever you're cup of tea is from modern wrestling and i guarantee if you're over here on ring respect radio chances are you like the kind of wrestling the papa smokes and i enjoy and before we get talking about our topics here tonight i'm going to go ahead and ask you to hit the subscribe button down below give us a thumbs up make sure to turn on the notification bell and let everybody know about ring respect radio Bob smokes we've been doing this show for quite some time now it was uh, about a year now that we've been doing this version of ring respect it was something we talked about doing for quite some time and getting into this podcast style that we've gone and done and the amount of growth we've done in exactly a year uh branching out with our friends over at backbreaker media and getting onto a lot of different podcasting streams it's really done a number for us and really got the name out there uh and it continues to get out there and I, i i couldn't be more thankful for everyone who's made it that way for us so far and uh, also for the great work that uh, you and I have been able to create this past year and uh, continue on making. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot to all the fans and all the listeners out there. It's been really nice to watch this project grow uh, from the early days of Rob's Rock and Wrestling podcast to Ring Respect Radio and uh, the various uh, incarnations we've had since then. And uh, it's been a good run so far. Let's keep her growing. Yeah, it's uh, been growing great, growing great. and uh, yeah, I love the uh, reference back to Rob's Rock and Wrestling, the uh, early uh, eras of getting this whole thing started and what a journey it's been since then. But uh, this is the new method, the podcast style that we do here, and we're loving it. Uh, it's also going to start including interviews coming up here. Uh, we just got done our one with Spencer Love of Love Wrestling. You can go check that out. That was a great time, but we're working on another big one here, Papa Smokes. Uh, a uh, very, very big um in, in my opinion, a big get for us here on Ring Respect. I think this is going to make for a very good interview. Uh, you and I have already talked about it, and we got to set that up coming up soon. But, uh, yeah, another great interview we're going to be able to share with the fans out there that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, I'm not uh, going to spoil the surprise or anything, but this one's close to home, and it's a, it's a big one. So I'm really looking forward to this. Let's get it set up, and uh, we'll have a nice chit-chat. Yeah, definitely so. So... Uh, speaking of chit chat, it's time to chit chat about some good wrestling, and that good wrestling coming from our friends over at MLW Major League Wrestling. Uh, we've been having a blast doing these reviews, these recaps, uh, just talking about MLW in general. And we're going to go through another couple of episodes of Fusion, so we're going to get right caught up with the uh, Fusion episodes that have been going on. Uh, MLW Fusion 123 and 124 are what we're going to be talking about. Um, so yeah, everybody go back, check out our previous episodes that we've done talking about MLW Fusion. They've been fantastic. Uh, it's been great interacting with them and I'm looking forward to the upcoming pay-per-view. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Bob Spoke is called Never Say Never. Yeah, that's right. Coming up, I think it's in two weeks. Yeah, looking forward to that one. A lot of big matches have been announced uh, prior to us recording here tonight that we won't... Uh, We'll go ahead and just uh, review because I think we'll get to a point where we're going to talk about that later episodes of Ring Respect here. But we're going to start off with MLW Fusion episode 123. And we started off this one here. There was a nice hype package done for this whole Injustice uh, versus uh, Contra unit feud that's been going on. And particularly highlighting Jacob Fatu versus Jordan Oliver, which we're going to see for the MLW Championship later on in the night here. Uh Great high package, in my opinion, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, they, they do it well. They always build up uh, some suspense for the end of the episode, and then uh, you can make come to your own conclusions about what happened after the main event, and it always will lead into the next episode, just as good proper booking does. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, so, yeah, so when we uh, kicked off with the action after that, we got right into this thing. We're having a uh, MLW Tag Team Championship match. Contribute unit, Davari and Simon Gotch taking on Los Parks, uh, accompanied by Selena De La Renta, and also accompanied, uh, it seemed like a guy wearing a suit in the background, kind of watching from the rampway. Did you notice that, Bob Smokes? 
Yeah, he's been there for the last few appearances that Selena's made, too. Uh, they've made reference that he is a representative of Azteca Underground and uh, possibly uh, someone who's just watching the uh, financial interests of Azteca Underground, uh, quietly watching from the sidelines for now. Uh, we'll have to see where this goes. And this brings up a point I want to make. A couple episodes, I, I get mixed up of where we recorded it, but we were talking about... Uh, El Jefe that they've mentioned, this is the boss and Azteca Underground that everybody seems to be wondering who it is. And I had made the prediction who I thought it was. I, I went and looked it up. It's Dario Cueto was his name. That was the head of Lucha Underground or the boss character on Lucha Underground that was in charge of the uh, Aztec Underground over there. A lot of the references really, really pointing in that direction as this starts to unfold. But again, We'll wait for the big reveal, but something tells me, Papa Smokes, that that could be where we're leading to with this reveal. Okay, well, we yeah, we he's remained mysterious at this point, but um, yeah, that's as good a guess as any. And uh, my prediction was going to be that it turns out to be a heel term Conan. That that that's a good guess too, man. That, that would be awesome. Yeah, we haven't seen Conan on TV for a while. He's been embroiled in that feud with. Selena De La Renta and uh, Promociones Dorado for the, the past couple of years on the MLW, and I just, I don't know, I I think that it would work if he uh, heel turned for some reason, and uh, we'll, we'll see what they set up, though. And he can play that. He can play the heel part really well too. I always like Conan in a heel role. Yeah, any part really. He's a he's a master of. Uh, pro wrestling for a long time yeah very underappreciated in many ways i think uh, i'd like to see more of him hopefully even if that isn't who the reveal is i hope he does come back in some uh capacity here with mlw shortly too yeah i'm sure he will but anyway we're getting sidetracked there sorry to get off track papa smokes but getting into this match it's contra unit navari simon gosh taking on Los parks the tag team champions again uh this one I thought maybe there would be shenanigans involved, but I thought maybe it wouldn't even kick off. But wrong I was, this one did kick off. And we had some uh, really good back and forth between these two teams. Uh, real good teamwork on both sides of the, both sides of the ring on this one. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like this match. Uh, uh, I like this team of Simon Gotch and Davari. I, I had been a bit critical of Simon, <clears throat> Simon Gotch in past episodes i was saying he wasn't looking too good he seems to be fine now and uh, he put in a good show in this match the champs also looking good los park said uh, in this case uh, la park and kehoe to la park um good looking match a um, uh, little difficult with two uh, very villainous teams fighting each other but uh, it still seemed like los parks was uh, doing the most of the cheating and rule breaking involved in this and all the cheap shots. So, uh, yeah, Los Parks definitely healing it up in this match. And man, I gotta say, like, the teaming of Los Parks, or in particular the uh, Hilo De La Park uh, and LA Park right now, has been great because I feel like Hilo De La Park is getting a lot of spotlight in these matches. He's getting to really shine and without pushing him as a singles competitor, we're really getting to see him unfold as a competitor before he ever gets to, you know, take the reins at a singles competition. Yeah, yeah, same thing with L.A. Park Jr. Uh, he's also just uh, being the kind of the third guy in the tag team and, and just learning and soaking in some knowledge as he goes along. So uh, this three-man tag is, is just uh, works out perfectly. They can use any combination and... Uh, now that they have the belts, I suspect they're going to have a stranglehold on that uh, championship for some time. Yes. And so that uh, championship, as they say, they got a stranglehold on it. They continue to have that stranglehold on it. But uh, not without uh, Contra getting costed the match and Justice interfering and costing the match there uh, behind the referee's back. A great way to keep uh, Justice getting that one up on Contra unit at the moment, really getting the better of them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, tip the hat to Injustice for uh, having the balls to step up to Contra unit. But here's another thing we've talked about for a while now. Contra's got feuds and battles going on on several fronts right now, and this can be difficult. Instead of just feuding with one team or one faction, they're feuding with several so that there are uh, 
people who want to attack them and cost them matches uh, all the time. So uh, this is another thing. If it, if it wasn't uh, Hammerstone or one of the other people feuding with Contra, then it's going to be injustice. And uh, they came out, interfered, uh, and uh, cost Contra unit the match. And uh, most parts with a pinfall victory, they get a nice... I would guess can't call it a clean victory, but uh, as far as the referee and the record books will show, that's a pinfall win. So uh, the champs looking tough and dominant in this match. Yeah, that's uh, I believe now two, two or three successful uh, tag team title defenses. So most parks uh, living up to the name of the champs right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they're looking good, especially with Selena by their side. <clears throat> she always uh, uh, provides. Uh, guidance from ringside and also in their business uh, ventures, making sure that uh, this serious El Jefe is uh, continuing to funnel money into her uh, into her ventures. And uh, as she said in, in one of her promos in this uh, show tonight, she's addicted to gold and she wants all the gold in MLW. So uh, she'll be looking at uh, once. And now that she's got the tag team championships, uh, she wants more gold, and she's going to be looking at the other belts in the company. Yeah, so watch out if you're a champion in MLW right now. Uh, but speaking of watching out, Los Parks better be watching out, because up next, the boys, Von Eric boys, if they had a little promo, and you know what? They're still gunning for those tag team titles eventually, but right now their beef really is with uh, Violence is Forever and uh, with Filthy Tom Lawler as well, too. We saw what uh, unfolded there at Filthy Island and the Von Eric boys. You know, they got a lot on their hands before they even start talking about going after those tag titles again. Yeah, it'll, it'll take them a while to uh, finish up with uh, uh, Team Filthy. Uh, and then, of course, Tom Lawler and the boys aren't too happy with the Von Erics either because as they see it, uh, the Von Erics completely ruined and rained on the, the Filthy Island fight card concept driving their Jeep into the ring uh, afterwards and uh, and uh, causing all kinds of uh, havoc all through the through the main event of that match. So uh, Filthy Tom, just, just as motivated, he's, he's uh, angry with the Von Erics and he wants them. So you can imagine it'll be him and some other, uh, it, him and some uh, combination of uh, violences forever will be going after the Von Erics matches. Maybe we can even see some six-man matches uh, with Von Erics are good friends with ACH. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this feud. This is going to be violent. Yeah, they've had so much great build-up going on over in MLW right now. And I know, like, uh, from listening to a lot of fans, they talk about the, you know their love for the Attitude Era. And you ask most of them what they loved about the Attitude Era, and it was always that everybody had something going on. There was a storyline for everybody. And it seems like with MLW... There is a little bit of that going on. Whether it's a big story or not, there's always something that seems to be unfolding for most of the roster going on there. They seem to have a plan in mind for all of them. They seem to have a clear path to what they're going to do, and they execute it quite nicely. And I think that gives everybody an opportunity, whether winning or losing, to actually get over in the company quite well. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, maybe maybe contrary to some of the storylines or uh, plots in in the attitude here as some of MLWs are just really nicely uh, simple, such as, you know, just take, uh, take the Von Erics as an example. They, they don't have any actual story or angle going on aside from that. They want to be good wrestlers. They want to win. They want to be the champions. And that, that, that's, that's enough of a story. I think for most wrestlers, um, you can get by on that one for a long time if, if you're good and you're over and you and you have to use that. Um, same thing with a guy like uh, Laredo Kid. Like he doesn't really have a story. He's just he's a wrestler that's trying to be good in wrestling, trying to get better, trying to get wins and establish a name for himself by getting some titles. And I, to me, that's the simplest and the best angle of them all. And uh, you can go a million different directions just with that uh, storyline in itself. So I, I appreciate the simplicity of some of these too. Yeah, and I think and I think that's kind of where I was leading to. It's not uh, like an unfolded story of you know these Jerry Springer like storylines that used to exist during the Attitude Era, more so just a 
logical sense as to where the booking is going. It's this guy is wanting to accomplish this. This is the path he's choosing to go. It makes sense. These are the players along the way. It all unfolds the way that a wrestling program should and continue to make you want to watch each week because each week they're unfolding more of what has been going on. There's continuity in what they're doing. The writing is doing well. The booking is doing well. And the, everybody on screen is doing well at the same time. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's in the court power, keeping it simple, keeping it back to basics. And what do you know? It works. Hey, even with experienced wrestling fans, you don't need uh, supernatural beings disappearing and, and people uh, vomiting up black slime and stuff. You can you can just do simple angles about wrestler wants to win. Wrestler got cheated out of his win, so now he wants to win even more. It works, and people get behind it. Yeah, I'm definitely behind it. Speaking again behind something, we're going to talk about the next match. We had, I guess this is a re-debut. I'm not familiar with him, but Mike Perrow must have been in MLW at some point in time, returning to the ring yeah. here tonight. Man, what a big hoss this boy is. Yeah, I'll say, hey, what a what a physique on the guy. Hey? I think he's been more active in uh, New Japan in the past few years, but he has been in MLW before mm-hmm. Yeah, what an absolute brute. Hey? He's got that caveman body. He's he's tall. He's over 300 pounds. You can tell he's a strong man. And uh, wow, what a debut, too. Yeah, coming in and taking on uh, Dugan. I, I'm trying to think here, Papa Smokes. Dugan, I believe, is the poor sap that either got beat in a matter of seconds to Hammerstone when MLW made a return, or else he was maybe one of the victims of Mods Kruger along the way. It was one of the two of them that uh, crushed Dugan yeah. last time. But uh, Dugan, yeah. yeah, he got a chop or two in there before getting completely annihilated by Mike Perro in this one. Perro absolutely destroyed Dugan in this match, did exactly what it needed to do, put this man over, and then he cuts that damn promo at the end. And, oh, just perfect. This guy wants to fight people. He's looking to beat the shit out of guys. I like it. I like Mike Perro. Yeah, also, what were we just talking about? The, the beauty of simplicity, right? Like... This guy just goes by his last name. He doesn't have a particular gimmick or anything like that. He's just big, huge, brutal, and strong. And then you, you watched his, his finishing move that he calls it the murder bomb. Oh, yeah. Good God, man. Can you imagine taking that poor Dugan? That, like, working or not, that looks like just the most giant impact when he landed on his back and that he lifted him up so high for that power bomb and then sat right down with it. It was it was beautifully uh, performed and uh, it looked absolutely great and put uh, Mike Perro over big time in his debut squash match. And, and the great thing is, is that they don't need to have guys kicking out of these moves five or six times. This is a legitimate <laughs> finishing move and it's treated that way in MLW. You don't see guys kicking out of everybody's finishers four or five times every single week on TV or anything like that. I mean, they, they do save it every once in a while for a special moment when you got a really big match between two guys and, you know, hey, oh, they kicked out of each other's finishers. Great, you know, that's okay in a big build. But, man, it's nice to see it not happening week to week on television. No, absolutely. And that's that's simply because the booking in MLW doesn't, allow for the preliminary talent to to get over that's that's not their job it's not their position you know like we you and i have discussed many times that that we we have a fondness for a few of the lower card guys especially guys like zen she and all that but you look at uh, this jason dugan i mean that's that's totally not what he's there for the the fans aren't meant to get behind jason dugan not at this point maybe in the future he will come past this and uh, advance to the point where he starts getting wins on TV. But as for now, that's not his job and not his position. Like you said, his job is to get the talent, the upper card talent over. So that's what he does. He, he takes a power bomb like nobody else. And, uh, and uh, I appreciate that about this show that, that we don't have to have competitive matches the whole time. Sometimes I just want to see what, what a new guy can do. Dugan is MLW's Barry Horowitz all the way. I love him. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget Bud Heavy. <laughs> well, Bud Heavy, I mean, he's just fantastic, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, unfortunately, no Bud Heavy on this show. But, uh, 
after we got to see Mike Perro absolutely dominate Dugan in that ring there, we had Filthy Tom Lawler, and he's uh, talking about the fallout from Filthy Island. And uh, Tom Lawler, uh, needless to say, a little bit pissed off with what went down there at Filthy Island, Pop Smokes. Yeah, just a little bit. And for one thing, he got his butt kicked at the end of it, got uh, thrown through the windshield of the Von Eric's truck. But uh, not to mention that they, he claimed they destroyed his TV set, his, his costly TV set. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he, you know that he's putting some of this on for sure. But uh, the, the, the dislike for each other goes on. This feud lives on. And uh, I think it's a good one. I think the Von Eriks versus uh, Team Filthy will be a good feud and will uh, be able to highlight it and also bring in some of these newer talents. Like, I don't think the Von Eriks are even all that experienced. Uh, like, I don't think they have years and years of matches under their belt, but obviously they're from a, a wrestling pedigree where they've been learning about the business since they were children. But uh, guys like Dominic Greeny and Kevin Koo are, are you know, shoot fighters, but uh, maybe the maybe just uh, look a little bit experienced in the business of professional wrestling. So they'll also get an education along the way too and, and make a little money and put some, hopefully put some butts in some seats if we can get uh, live crowds going again. I'm looking forward to this feud. Yeah, it's unfolding beautifully. And I hope, uh, like we keep mentioning it, uh, a three, three versus three, six man tag match between Team Filthy versus the Von Ericks and ACH has got to be down the road. Maybe at Never Say Never. I mean, either way, it's it's got to happen at some point, and I'm really looking forward to it. I like all the people involved there, and then you got some experience in the ring that can also try to teach some of these young guys and stuff like that to help them along the path. And I think we're seeing some uh, great young talents in the making. Yeah, I think so too. And then another angle I like they have was this next little segment with uh, Buku Doubt. Uh, finally, we get to hear words from him about uh, the treatment he's taken from. TJP recently. What did you think of this little promo? I wrote it right down here. I absolutely love this man, Buku Dell. I was, I was stunned. Man, he was right fired up. He's real pissed off at TJP, and he sounded like a guy who meant what he was saying. It sounded great from him. This surprised me in every sense of the word because he didn't. The words coming out of his mouth mouth didn't necessarily match the body type of this kid. But shit, pop smokes. He got me interested in this thing. Yeah, I, I felt the same way about it too, including uh, his uh, incidents with TJP kind of pushing him around in the ring a little bit. And I thought, wow, if, if this turns into a feud, this might be pretty one-sided. Uh, TJP's a very experienced and uh, skilled grappler and all that. And it seems like Buku Dao just still kind of being trained, still being mentored by TJP as he goes along here. So I thought, man, this... This might be kind of a one-sided feud, but uh, he, he sold me on some of this uh, with that promo. And uh, we've talked about his physique and stuff before, too. He's obviously a disciplined man. Uh, he obviously has no problem with working hard or anything like that. So I'm starting to think this is evening out on the playing field a bit here. But, and I think we're going to see a good grudge match coming up in the near future between uh, TJP and Buku Dao. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it after this promo. I think this, again, you said it won't be such a one-sided feud. It sounds like Buku Dao can carry himself, both in promo. Obviously, he's capable in the ring. We've seen that before, and it seems like MLW want to push him. I think this promo made me start to realize why MLW seems so heavily invested in Buku Dao. There seems to be something there, and they're seeing it right now, and they want to capture it at this moment right now and be able to be the ones that really kind of escalate this kid's career. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. I thought, um, when they first started appearing together, I thought that they might be a, a tag team together for a while, you know, and, uh, have a few wins, have a few losses and, and go through a bit of drama, but it seems like, uh, they're just getting on with the breakup and the feud quite quickly. So you might be onto something with that once and they maybe want to jump on something right now. Yeah, we'll see how it unfolds, but definitely looking forward now to Buku Dao at TJP more than ever. So uh, up next, we had a promo, Jordan Oliver cutting a promo about his match coming up with Jacob Fought 2. That's going to be later in the program. Um, Oliver continues to impress uh, with his words. He's definitely getting up there uh, each and each week. Um, 
it it is a c- couple of these are starting to run together a little bit for me. Um, the promos are sounding a little bit the same leading up to this match, but definitely he, it feels like he means it. And what he's saying makes sense. It's logical. He's pissed off. He wants to take on the champ. He wants to not be treated like he's that uh, same baby face kid that came in, even though it's hard to hear him say that because he's still really got that baby face going on for him. Yeah. And it's going to be hard to get past that anytime too soon. But I mean, He's getting there, man. There's there's a lot of growth happening with uh, Jordan Oliver, and uh, we're definitely going to talk more about that as we get to the main event for sure. What do you think of the promo? Uh, yeah, similar to you, I think. Uh, he's not bad. He he's tends to be a little bit silly sometimes, like uh, with his, uh, I don't know if it's kind of a rap thing or something, but he kind of tries to make the little high voice sometimes. It, it comes across as goofy once in a while, but... I still think he's coming along nicely in general. Uh, it, is it just me, Munson, or did you notice this on uh, these two shows uh, that we're reviewing today, 123 and 124? Are they suddenly swearing a lot more in their promos? Yes, they are, man. And it's not yeah. just George. Like, I noticed it with Jordan Oliver at first slipping a few in, but I'm noticing it more from everybody else. And, I mean, personally, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, if it feels legit, then go for it, but... Man, they're really starting to cut through with quite a few of them, and I think there was a couple of f bombs dropped in the middle of this promo. Yeah, I I don't know how uh, uh, how it works with uh, their show on on YouTube or anything like that. Or certainly we're allowed to swear in ours, but uh, yeah, I, it it kind of just struck me as a sudden thing. <laughs> You know, I, I noticed it with Jacob Fa too. Too, uh, he he's never one to mince words, and he, he does speak pretty roughly. But uh, yeah, he he had a couple f bombs in there too that kind of perked my ears up. Yeah. Personally, I, I, being someone that's not offended by that, I like it. It gives it it gives it a legitimacy and kind of an intensity too. And uh, uh, you know, when people are swearing on TV, that there's some emotion there, and uh, I, I I'm all for it. Yeah, you know what, uh, I am too, and. The, I'm glad you brought up the, the YouTube thing, so I'll go over that real quick to hear. I'm pretty sure that when they air on FUBU or DAZN or something like that, I know DAZN is usually an episode or two behind with MLW, so they have time to edit some of those promos out and make sure that that's not heard on regular TV, I guess, for cable okay. TV purposes. Uh, I, I think, anyway, I'd have to do a little digging. But with YouTube, the way it works is that YouTube, technically, you can have freedom of speech for the most part. Uh, You can't, like, we can sit here and drop F-bombs all day long if we want to. Um, Usually, there's these bots that kind of check through videos, and they tend to check the first little bit of a video to see if there's any content that should be flagged or anything like that. Once it gets past that, it kind of gets to that point where they don't check as, as far into it unless somebody makes a legitimate complaint about the video itself. So... There's a good chance the MLW, because they have their own sponsored ads, probably aren't necessarily worried about getting demonetized on YouTube, which is why I would think that Court Bauer is allowing the freedom in the promos at this point in time. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Either way, I'm glad to hear it, but uh, YouTube, there's a lot of weird stuff they don't allow on there, including... uh certain kinds of political talk and stuff like that. So I'm never sure where their boundaries are or what side you have to be on to uh, be able to post videos. But, uh, yeah, I I like the intensity of the swearing in their videos. Yeah, there's a whole rabbit hole we could go down with the YouTube stuff anyway. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of my feeling there is that's why it's being allowed more. Uh, But, yeah, it's great for fans like us, uh, probably a lot of the ones that are tuning in on a regular basis. It really ups that intensity. And, I mean, you know, you see it now with uh, companies like AEW allowing guys to just say shit whenever they want to. I mean, these words are becoming more commonplace and being realized as just words. So I feel like that freedom of speech is getting to be a little bit more vocal on modern day television as it is anyway. Okay, well, that's good because it, a lot of stuff is really getting heavily censored now, and uh, not just for swearing or hate speech content, but uh, for ideology as well. And that doesn't sit very comfortably in my mind, uh, in any form of censorship, uh, aside from stuff that's blatantly illegal like hate speech. But uh, at any rate, that, yeah, that's not a rabbit hole we need to go down here now. But uh, no, exactly. yeah, interesting. Yeah, for sure, man. 
And then uh, from there in the night, after we got over the uh, promo, we went over to more in-ring action. And we got the Laredo Kid taking on Calvin Tankman. And we saw just last uh, episode, Tankman had taken on Zenshi. And we were talking about uh, that being one of the most competitive matches that Calvin Tankman had had to date. Well, guess what, Papa Smokes? This one even more so competitive. Zenshi really, uh, at times, taking it to tell ta Calvin Tankman in this. And even maybe exposing a little bit of a weakness in Calvin Tankman's game that we have yet to be seen out of the heavyweight hustle. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I thought Laredo Kid uh, had a really good game plan going into this match. He uh, wrestled smart. Uh, all these MLW matches, I love it how they wrestle, wrestle for like the first two or three minutes. Like it's a, it's a trading of holds and a reversing of holds and it's mat wrestling and chain wrestling on the mat. I really, really like that. But uh, Laredo Kid was having his way with Tankman at the very beginning, beginning of this good game plan, going after his legs, slowing the big guy down. And it uh, looked like he had something going until T Tankman hit. Uh, I, I'm not sure what his move is called. I'm just going to call it the pounce, but that, uh, flying shoulder tackle that he does is just looks so great and is so devastating from a big guy that certainly slowed down the Laredo kid for a bit well and that bump that Laredo kid took off of that and I mean the bumps in general from a Laredo kid are just immaculate to begin with but the one he yeah. took off Calvin Tankman's shoulder through diving shoulder thrust move there fuck like he did it like he had, must have been how many the rounds he took there, it was a good 360 or more that he spun around and still took a beautifully perfect bump, not making it look silly one bit. Yeah, yeah, and hence the skill of a guy like the Laredo kid that even in taking a bump, a, a, as JR would say, a hellacious bump like that that's spinning you around and upside down and everything, still making the nice flat back drop onto the mat that makes a nice loud bang and... Uh, this sells the living shit out of this move and out of Calvin Tankman, and damn, it looked great, but Tankman uh, slowed the match down even from there. The, the big man had uh, just started using the power moves all over Laredo Kid and uh, smothering him and just throwing him down, giving them, giving them all strength moves and stuff. And then Laredo Kid uh, evaded a, a corner charge by Calvin Tankman and started to get his aerial offense going. And then Tankman looked to be on his heels for a bit there. And, uh, you know, I kind of had it predicted in my mind that this would be a victory for Tankman. But I must admit, they kind of had me wondering for a bit there. Because after the Laredo kids' title loss, too, I thought, well, geez, are they going to give this kid a big win in this match? I, it had me second-guessing myself that we're... Were you in the same boat in this match? I really was, especially when he got that close call with the pinfall there. It was a good two and a half, and man, I was oh, man. on the edge of my seat, Papa Smokes. I thought, Jesus Christ, they're going to pull this off. Laredo Kid beating Tankman here. Oh, like, what's that going to mean for Tankman? But man, huge for Laredo Kid if he would have. But, you know, even still coming out of this one with a loss, Laredo Kid looked fucking sharp. Like, he looked good in this one. Yeah, yeah, he is sharp. You know, when I first started watching him, I, I was kind of had the feeling with this guy got a lot of wins, and I think he is an upper card guy in in AAA in Mexico. But uh, uh, he always looks like he's going to win his matches, and of course, that's a sign of a great wrestler, especially a a, a preliminary talent or a, a a guy that performs the job that he does uh, in the wrestling ring. But he's making it look like like he's got every chance of winning all these matches, and uh, I, I got to tip my hat to him. It, it's really, really good uh, pro wrestling work. Yeah, well, especially like with a small guy being able to make it look legitimate to be a big guy. It's not just the big guy taking, you know, ridiculous bumps. Like you know, if Laredo Kid's coming off the rope and hitting a clothesline on Tankman, and Tankman's taking the bump right off the hop. I mean, we're not going to buy it. I mean, right there, you're selling it that this is not legitimate in any way shape or form but the way Laredo Kid busted Tankman down and the moves that he performed on him he was able to take the big man down in a way that would have you believing that there was an opportunity for the Laredo Kid to pick up the victory and that's what made it so beautiful in every sense of the word yeah and that's also why 
sometimes people don't think anything of the first three, four, five minutes of a match, but sometimes that's important to the storytelling too. And uh, we saw that with uh, uh, Laredo Kid working over Tankman's legs, and then and then Tankman didn't have that firm base underneath, and it makes a difference with those big guys. Of course, it wasn't enough to win, but it was enough to make it look like, well, I don't know who's going to win this. And when uh, Laredo Kid got those couple of close two counts there, I, I started to uh, edge up on my seat there too, thinking, what the heck is going to happen in this match? And, well, we saw what happened, and uh, there was a sudden reversal and a comeback, and Tankman hit the Tankman driver, and uh, that was it, one, two, three. But just as I have written in my notes here, great competitive match. That's exactly what it was. Yeah, it really was. Tankman looked good. Uh, Laredo Kid looked great coming out of this thing, even though he took the loss. Uh, great for both guys in every sense. I mean, they put on a great show. Um, this is what I love about MLW is when you can have – Two guys go in there and just make it fun and make you sit on the edge of your seat and guess. Like, I don't want to always have a good feeling about what's going to happen and be right every time. I want there to be a reason for me to second guess my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. That's finally uh, booked wrestling when, when even the veterans aren't sure what's going to happen. Yeah. And I think I missed something in my notes, Bob Smokes, before this match took place. I believe there was the... Uh, backstage interview there, uh, and that's going to lead into what the next segment is, too. Um, there was the backstage part with Alicia Toot and Selena De La Renta, where uh, Selena actually dropping the message that everybody's kind of uh, caught on to Alicia and uh, Richard Holiday's little thing they've got going on and everything like that. Uh, this put Alicia into a bit of a frenzy, and then well, she went back and found uh, Richard Holiday and Hammerstone backstage and was questioning this whole thing. And uh, quite the quite the little segment we got out of there. A little bit of a little bit of mixing it up with some comedy in between the matches, I guess, with these guys. Yeah, I suppose. I'm, like I'm following along with everyone else. I don't know if I care so much who the interview girl might or might not be dating, or whether or not it's a wrestler. But maybe they're leading towards something with this. I, I think Holiday is is funny and good as a as a as a comedic spot wrestler too. So th this works for me and, and uh, getting teased a little bit by his buddy Hammerstone and, and Alicia is acting like she's not into it, but you can kind of see that Richard is, and I don't know. It, it's, it's a, it's a little funny bit. They don't waste a whole bunch of time on it or anything like that, but they've planted the seed of this story and we'll just see where it goes from here. Yeah. It's a, it's a minor thing. It's, it's a little bit of comedy on the side that doesn't overdo it. So it's, you know, it's something that you can handle. It's it's fine. I mean, with Alicia, they have her as the one interviewer. And at least, unlike some companies, they, they've made it very apparent who is their backstage interviewer. She is part of the show. She's known to the fans. They're aware of who she is. Kind of like the good old days of when you had guys like Gene Okerlund. Not comparing her in any way to Gene Okerlund, especially at this point in her career. But in that sense, you knew who was the person backstage that's going to be taking care of these interviews. Yeah, yeah, and not that it really matters, but I, I much prefer her to the backstage girl they have at ROH who is, takes her shtick to the very annoying stage, but uh, Alicia plays it pretty straight. She's nice, she gets the job done, and I think she's all right. Yeah, yeah, fellow Canadian, so props to her. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so after that, uh, we had Joseph Samael kind of cut in. He gave a promo on uh, everything going down tonight with... How Jordan Oliver is basically not going to be walking out alive. I mean, he again just cutting a fantastic promo as he always does, really making you believe that Jordan Oliver is in over his head. That Fatu is going to murder him in the ring tonight. Great promo. I, I nothing more I can really add. Papa Smokes, how about yourself? Yeah, I don't know if I can add to it, but I got to uh, second that that I just love Fatu's promos. He is such a rough talker, man. This guy should be on a rap album or something. He Actually talks really good, but but so tough too. He's always talking about everybody's bitch ass and stuff all the time. It's excellent and it's totally uh, convincing. It totally works for the kind of dominant uh, bully type champion that he is, and I, I love it. Yeah, you. He's everything that's always been great about the Samoan uh, legacy and wrestling and stuff like that. Just love everything he does, and 
going to see more of that coming up here. But before we get to that main event talk here, Pop Smokes, the PWI came in with their list this week. And for once, it wasn't the regular top 10. This time, we got the PWA top 5 tag teams list in MLW. Uh, we're going to go through this one. Uh, interesting list, to say the least. Number 5, the Dirty Blondes. I was surprised about this one because we really haven't even seen them since uh, the, the pay-per-view event back in January. So... A little stunned they made the list, but then I was trying to think of who else could be on there, and we, I don't think MLW's got enough teams to really go much deeper than that. Uh, yeah, and the, that was going to be their new team debuting, and who knows what's going on in the COVID age. Maybe they can't get to the tapings, or maybe there's something COVID-related that's not allowing them to be there or whatever, but uh, I think this is a team that they do want to feature in the, in the future, so stick them in there at number five and see what happens in the future. You bet, man. Uh, number four, no surprise, Injustice making the list. Again, great uh, pairing those two are. Uh, number three, Violence is Forever. Great combination there, Kevin Koo and Dominic Garini. Uh, number two, Contra Unit, Davari and Simon Gotch, who earlier we talked about looking fantastic, um, making it in at the number two spot. And then number one, you got the Vaughn Ericks, the former tag team champions. And, of course, that they're, they're going to be right there chasing that gold eventually once they're done with their uh, problems with Team Filthy. And, of course, the tag team champions, Los Parks, who we said before, looking fantastic. Great win for them as well over Contra Unit, keeping themselves looking strong. Um, no real beefs with the list. Again, PWI doing a great job with these lists each and every week. Yeah, they've been making uh, rankings for... God, how many years now since the 60s or something. So uh, they know how to make a top 10 list. It's it's not just wins and losses, but it's kind of momentum and, and fan support or, or fan support slash fan hatred just as long as you have some. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it just gives the fan, uh, reminds the fan a little bit of who's all in there and could be coming up for title shots and, and still working on it. Yeah, man. So yeah, good list there, and uh, from there, right before we get to the main event matchup, we had a promo from Gino Medina uh, challenging Gringo Loco. He's uh, frustrated with Gringo Loco for uh, disparaging his family's heritage and everything like that, so he's putting a challenge down on the table for this uh, matchup. I guess this is kind of the, the, the build for Gino Medina to uh, kind of get on the uh, singles path here in MLW. I think Gringo Loco is his kind of... A, his feud that they're going to go with here off the hop. And I guess that makes a lot of sense talking about the heritage of his family and how he feels to Gringo Loco is disrespecting that name. Yeah. Yeah. He had mentioned, or Gino Medina had mentioned that his father was a luchador in years past and had been part of a faction called uh, Gringos Locos. So there, you know, he, he obviously doesn't like, uh, especially a non Mexican or non luchador guy using that name so uh they've got that built into a little bit of a feud i think they're just still trying to launch gino medina i think uh they have high hopes for this kid they, they've been trying to launch him for a while now if you remember even before the covid shutdown they had they had had him as the uh third member of dynasty when when mjf left for AEW, and uh that just didn't seem to work out for very long at all so uh he, he had been fired uh, last year sometime and then still has the heat with Richard Holiday, and I still think they're going to have a program together at some point. They are both uh, heels, but I'm sure they can work around that somehow. That it, it, it looks like convincing real heat. As it, like, just as uh, Medina says, he quit Dynasty and, and uh, Holiday claims that he fired him. Yeah, well, this is, uh, is going to be... Uh, uh, disagreement it has been for the past year and I think it will be in the future and uh, maybe once Medina gets finished with Gringo Loco we might see him in a program with Richard Holiday. Yeah and talking about them both being heels, so Holiday almost toes the line in some ways too with his friendship with Hammerstone and stuff like that like he's, he does play the heel and he plays it quite well a lot of the time but uh, his friendship with Hammerstone o almost kind of, you know, eliminates that little bit of that heel sense and stuff and brings a little bit of the babyface side to it as well. So there might be a way in utilizing that to get around the whole heel versus heel aspect of Gino Medina and Richard Holiday in a program together. Okay, yeah, that sounds logical. So, 
But speaking of logical, we're finally at the main event, Papa Smokes. This one for the MLW Heavyweight Championship. It's the champion, Jacob Fatu, taking on Jordan Oliver of Injustice. Uh, this one, you know, going to be an interesting matchup. We've seen the build to this taken off. Uh, interesting to see if Oliver would be in over his head. Um, man, he took off really strong off the start, really get, kicking things off into high gear there, taking the fight to Fatu. Again, something you really need to do with a champion like Fatu, throw him off his game and get in there. And that's exactly what Jordan Oliver did to kick this one off. Uh, what do you think the openings of this matchup here? Yeah, I liked it. They they uh, built a little bit of tension by having Oliver do some tough, tough talking before the match, saying, I don't care if it goes 10 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour, you can't beat me and you can't finish me because I just won't let you. I'll absorb everything you give me. You can't outlast me because I'm from the streets and I've been beat up a million times. But if you watch this match and you see Oliver get to the ring, you can see the look on his face is pretty clear. He is extremely nervous. There's a good uh, bit of fear in that face too, and for good reason because he's got Jacob Fatu and, and God knows who else from Contra coming out to the ring. But in the spirit of a good professional wrestler, he's not going to let that bother him. He hits Fatu with the dive through the ropes before the match has even begun, before Fatu even gets in the ring. And man, this match was on real fast. Yeah, and then you know what I love? There was uh, shortly after the whole Oliver getting the advantage and stuff like that, he went to go for that dive again right after his momentum had built and Fatu went to the outside. And he goes for the suicide dive, and Fatu catches him into that Samoan drop and drops him right back onto the padding. Man, what a great spot that was, Pop Smokes. Yeah, totally beautiful, and, and shows that you can think you got something going on, Fatu, but he's always watching, and, and he's not as hurt as you think he is, and he's going to reverse something on you. That spot was awesome. How strong is Fatu to catch a, another 200 pound guy in, in midair and just drop him on his back like that? Uh, Real nice spot. Everything he does is just executed with just brilliance. Like you, you even slow some of it down just to watch watch some and just notice how perfectly he is getting guys into these holds. He's performing these moves. They look dangerous while at the same time, if you watch it carefully, performed very safely at the same time. So everything he does is to a level of perfection that I believe needs to be seen by a much bigger audience. Not saying that I want to see Fatu leave to a bigger audience. I want the audience to come to MLW. I believe the wrestling fans out there are truly missing out on some great action here with that Major League Wrestling. And they're missing out on watching a legend in the making with Jacob Fatu. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, and it's just, he plays his role so well as, as the champ, the, the heel champ that cheats to... to hold on to his belt and has a whole posse watching over him, a whole uh, faction whose only job it is, is to keep that belt around Fatu's waist. It's nice. It, it's a, it's a classic wrestling trope. They've used it a million times, but it's, that's the reason is it's effective and it works. People have been trying to dethrone Jacob Fatu from that uh, MLW championship, but for two years now and just, uh, no one's even really come all that close yet, I don't think, because Contra's always watching. And never mind that, Fatu himself. Can you imagine somebody pinning his shoulders for a three count? Like, it's almost unthinkable. So he's really got an a excellent status in, at the top of this company, and uh, it doesn't look like he's going to let go of it. No, and I mean, they built it up so strongly that when they do finally pull the trigger on Fatu, losing the championship, it is going to be a monumentous, monumentous occasion. I mean, whoever finally beats this man, one, two, three, in the middle of that ring, it's going to become epic for their career. It's going to be one of the most talked about things in professional wrestling, or should be the most talked about thing in professional wrestling. And it's going to mean something, a championship change that actually means something in a modern era. I mean, God, can you fathom the thought, Bob Smokes, of something being so meaningful still in professional wrestling? Well, not, not in the big companies, really. I mean, it, it just it seems like everyone gets their turn with the belt now, and it's, it's not really a surprise when it changes hands because they often do change hands every month or two kind of thing, and we just we saw the Miz win the title recently in the, in the big companies and all that stuff, and it's just, I, I don't know. It, it, the belts and the championships have been devalued in the 
the big companies a lot. And that, that's why I like the smaller companies these days is that they've taken it back to that, uh, the, the championship and being all important. And the only focal point in the entire company is to get that championship belt. And, and just like NWA does too, with the 10 pounds of gold and having all this sit on top for so long, it, it, it actually raises, raises the prestige of the belt that, that, hardly anyone can ever touch the damn thing because that's how hard it is to win it yeah and i mean yeah you bring up all this there it's uh it's he's another one i mean you can't think of a guy at this point being able to put the win over nick all this if it weren't for the one little blip of him dropping it temporarily to cody rhodes there which you know was a great moment in pro- professional wrestling when it happened i mean you uh, nick all would still be the champion ongoing if it weren't for that one tiny in between there, and we would be seeing one of the longest NWA championship reigns in history. Uh, we could still be on to seeing that as well, too. And I think uh, MLW is doing the exact same kind of thing here with FA2. I believe that it's going to be no time soon, even if we do see it even this year. I, I starting to think maybe this isn't even going to be the year that Jacob FA2 loses that title. I think the program is going to start rolling into next year before we even see that championship change hands. Yeah, there's really only one person I could see uh, logically or believably beating him, and uh, that could happen still. But uh, uh, the way uh, Fatu has looked so indestructible as champ, I, I, I can't even really see most of the roster beating him. Uh, I, it just it, it doesn't seem believable whatsoever. But that's the great thing. It's like even before this match kicked off, they had – an image of all the MLW champions that have existed so far. And it, despite this company being around a while, there has been only a handful of guys that have held the MLW championship, which brings a lot of prestige to that belt. And again, if you've only got one guy in mind, and we know we're talking about Hammerstone here, if we built up Hammerstone to be the only guy that it seems logical to beat Jacob Fought too, if he does become the next guy amongst the list of champions that have existed there then you know fantastic because he deserves to be up there uh and everybody who has been there has done a great job of holding this championship up to this time and i think they're going to continue on this path of absolute prestige their champions are going to be built up strong and they're going to remain looking strong because that's what a true wrestling fan wants to see yeah very well put on I, I think the belt's in good hands but I wanted to talk even just we got off track from this match. It almost looked like we were going to have a change in this match, too, for a couple moments there. I I never gave uh, Oliver much of a chance in my mind, but uh, some of the spots in this were pretty convincing, including uh, Byron Reed interfering from the outside. Uh, uh, You know that injustice isn't beyond bending the rule book a little bit, and uh, Reed uh, inserting his himself into this match uh, with some interference and then uh, we also had uh, Jordan Oliver working over the the left leg of Jacob Fatu and then that became a, a, a thing in this match too as we watched Fatu try to do that bouncing corner moonsault and uh, you know, the leg wasn't having it too and uh, he had to uh, he had he was going to just try and climb up and do that moonsault and uh, Oliver jumps up on the second rope and German suplexes Fatu off the top rope onto the back of his neck in the middle of the ring. And did that look good? And that that also popped me. I didn't see that one coming. No, it looked, it looked great because it didn't look like there was a hell of a lot of cooperation in the move either, too. So they did it so quickly that it looked like a legitimate move being performed, not something two guys had to count to fucking three before they did. Absolutely, and and just the result of Fatu uh, bumped so hard on that that it took, that it looked like wow, he could be, you know, either uh, shoot injured or uh, working injured in this match. Either way, uh, Jordan Oliver continues on with the momentum, and this gives him uh, a couple of cutters. We know that's his usual finishing finishing move, and uh, Fatu just kicking out of the of the pins. Until he finally uh, gained the advantage back, still got his uh, Samoan drop and moonsault, and then did get the one, two, three on Jordan Oliver, just as everybody kind of thought or knew he would. But uh, wow, there was some tense moments in this match too. Yeah, there really was, and man, yeah, all in, uh, Jordan Oliver, all in all, 
very convincing. Uh, a, lot, a lot of those moves look great. Again, we've said this kid is building, and definitely so if he continues to work, especially on getting himself even more physically uh, with that build that he's going for and stuff like that. Keep that going. You know, get yourself up there. This kid's going to look great in years to come. I mean, a lot of work to be done, but there was something to be said about this particular match and being able to step it up to that level and show, like, yeah, you can hang with the big boys and that you deserve to be you know, in contention for some of the championships along the way. And it maybe made him look like a strong contender for going into, say, another championship uh, down the road. Like, we're I know we're not going to see him in a program with Hammerstone anytime soon, but uh, if anything ever happens with the Openweight Championship down the road, there could be a good feud for Jordan Oliver waiting in the wings there. Absolutely. And I think as he comes along, he'll be able to match up with the more different wrestlers on the roster and, and that's what a well-rounded wrestler is you can have a match against anybody uh, and not just people on his own uh, uh, company's roster but anybody and, and that's that's how you that's how you branch out is working with different people lots of matches lots of working lots of practice all the time and and Jordan Oliver's young he's 22 or 23 he just doesn't have the same amount of reps in that a lot of these guys have so uh, yeah I you think- know, I, a heavyweight championship match for him at that young age is just a massive learning experience and a confidence booster for a young wrestler. Yeah, I believe I heard St. Laurent actually mentioned uh, 22 years old. So, I mean, there's no doubt that he's uh, young and uh, just getting his feet wet in the wrestling business. But, man, I mean, it's great to see these guys unfold. And I think as we see more of Jordan Oliver, I think we're going to see some great things out of this kid coming up. And great match there. But... Let's talk about what happened after the match. So, uh, Contra unit getting the better of injustice this time. Uh, Myron Reed getting involved with this one now, and just an absolute beatdown of injustice. And the body bags come out once again here. Contra unit looking to put injustice away for good. They're zipping up those body bags, and out of nowhere, here comes heavyweight hustle Calvin Tankman coming to make the save. Man, Papa Smokes. This shit looked awesome. When Calvin Tankman went toe-to-toe with Jacob fought to, I was definitely off my seat, definitely popping. This one looked great, and the two of them mixed it up quite well in this segment. Oh, for sure. And uh, I was not expecting that at all. That once the body bags came out and Justice were going in, I thought, yeah, this is pretty much how I pictured this ending. But then the big save from Calvin Tankman was really quite exciting and it, it also kind of makes sense that he would uh, that he might want to be friends with Injustice uh, as they're uh, just it seems like they might be guys that would get along well so uh, he came out with the save and uh, the, the, the boys are loving it afterwards uh, Oliver and Reed they, they were quite pleased to welcome uh, Tankman and uh, if, if indeed he's going to be the new member of Injustice we don't know this yet but uh, at for the time being, at least, they're going to work uh, in cooperation with each other. And here's another six-man tag team we match. We could have Contra versus Injustice uh, six-man style. That Wouldn't that be good? Yeah, it makes for a lot of possibilities. It's building up fantastically. I loved this. It gave Tankman something to do. And again, he's now he's gotten in the mind of Jacob Fought too. He's gone straight through to the champion. There's guys like Hammer have been you know, aching for that ch- championship opportunity and proving themselves week after week. And Tankman says, no, I'm cutting to the front of the fucking line here and I'm going to go out there, slap the champ around and get his get his attention. And I loved it. This was a great finish to, I would say, one of my favorite overall MLW Fusion episodes. Yeah, yeah, I can't disagree with that. This one was good all the way through. And uh, that, that main event really had me... Uh, Wondering what was going to happen. Great finish, great run in at the end, and then uh, yeah, new alliances and, uh, and new battles popping up for the future. The, the Core Bowers booking is going great in this, and uh, what a finish! And uh, I'm excited for more. Yeah, what a what a great show it was. I really loved it, Papa Smokes. And you know what? Uh, we're hitting about the hour mark already here on Ring Respect, so I think we're going to wrap up 123 here today, and then uh, we're going to. Uh, 
See you guys again very shortly for another episode of Ring Respect Radio. We'll order a review MLW Fusion episode 124. But from Pop Smokes and I, thank you for tuning in once again. Remember to hit the subscribe button down below and the notification bell. And continue to tune in to Ring Respect Radio. Check us out on Backbreaker Media. And check out all our friends in the industry that are doing fantastic work out there. Once again, thank you. And we'll see you again soon.